this government is serious, by the way, do you know that certain provisions have never been actualized? Mm. Mm. For example, there is a requirement to pass an act of parliament to re regulate funding of political parties. That is the law we should be talking about, not, the, not amending the Constitution. Let's pass that law. There are many other laws, other provisions that are still remain in abeyance. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil has come upon us. Yet made we not our prayer before the Lord our God, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand thy truth. That statement was really energizing. But uh, it's one thing to make all these lofty uh, statements, but the reality is totally different. But there is another way in which also the judiciary has been undermined, in the sense that you see the evolution, uh, the, the judiciary has evolved. If you check the Constitution, we started by providing in the Constitution that the judiciary shall be independent administratively. Then in 2016, when we amended the Constitution, we went further and said the judiciary shall be financially independent. Okay? Because the point is that administrative independence means nothing if you have no financial, mm -hmm. you have no money to run, uh, to, to, uh, to run the judiciary. Now, that financial autonomy has not been realized. I was even forced to take a case to court to compel the executive branch of government to put in place measures to ensure that the judiciary is financially independent. There was a judgment which uh, directed that such measures be put in place, and none of those measures have ever been put in place. When you say they should be financially independent, what do you mean? What it means is that the current system is that literally judges are beggars. The judiciary begs for money from the executive branch of government. Financial independence meant that the judiciary should have its own budget, receive its own funds, and be able to manage its own fund. Now, if you check the law, not only should the judiciary be financially independent, the Constitution expressly provides that the judiciary shall be adequately, not just funded, mm. adequately funded. But that has not happened. Right now, judges are some of the uh, lowly paid uh, civil servants. For example, some judges, I think by some account, uh, their salary is about, maybe they get uh, around $2,000 a month. For a judge, we ought to. That is why, for example, other branches of government, other institutions of government, can struggle in terms of funding, but the judiciary should never. Should never. Okay, because once the judiciary is gone, the whole country is gone, and that's exactly what has happened. There is no talk about improving it, the the conditions of uh, judges. There is another problem, where you deliberately cripple an institution. For instance, the last time I checked, I think we have uh, just about 100 judges for the whole country. Nobody talks about these figures. That's right. So you're talking about one judge servicing 200,000 people. Okay? So it means the five judges per million Zambians. I mean, you're a joker. There is no way a judiciary can function in that, in that manner. The case load is just unbelievable. There is no way, even if you got the brightest lawyers, there is no way they can deliver on those uh, such numbers. Yes, but, but in fairness to the conflict between the DG and the board, this is a problem to do with the law. And this is what I've argued to say. When you are serious about fighting corruption, you have to look at how well equipped are the institutions given the mandate to fight corruption. Okay? Now, clearly we have a dysfunction here between members of the board and the DG, uh, members of the board and the director general faces. In a normal situation, 
you should have the president appointing the board and the board appointing the DG. But that is not the case with the, under the current anti-corruption uh, act. What it is is that both the DG and the board members are appointed by the president. Now, how do you expect the DG now to account to the board when he's going to tell me, say, hey, the same person that appointed you is the same, the same person that appointed me? Okay? But the situation that we had under the 1996 Act, which was passed during the time of uh, Dr. Chiluba, it was a far more robust uh, statute because all what it did is that it created the anti the commissioners. Yeah constituted the anti-corruption commission. Now, obviously some genius came along the way and watered down that, and we find ourselves in this situation. And that is why we're saying that the fight against corruption is a joke, in the sense that for you to, to be effective, you have to make sure uh, that the institution you have given the responsibility to carry out that task is the right institution, adequately equipped, adequately staffed by the right people and adequately funded. But the way it is currently, there is no way uh, any, uh, you'd get anything uh, serious from the Anti-Corruption Commission. But I've also argued mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. our system of fighting corruption is a farce. Ordinarily, you should have a system that should prevent corruption. Our system is designed to say, okay, you can take a bribe, get involved in corruption, provided you don't get caught. Okay? So there is no mechanism to, uh, to, 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 to prevent corruption. And I've argued that one of the things we could have done is to pick up a leaf, uh, uh, pick up the experience that we had under UNIP, where uh, there was a leadership code. You may not call it a leadership code. You can call it maybe public... Uh, uh, officers code of conduct for example mm -hmm. where all those involved in the public service are required one of the requirements would be to declare the assets everyone everyone that was the system now the problem also is that you see we have lessons good experiences and so forth which you could pick up from but unfortunately because there is really no desire to fight corruption we just give lip service to it Okay, one of the things that is under the leadership code, for example, was it affected everybody, uh, people that were uh, working for government or government-related institutions. Mm -hmm. So if you are working for a parastatal body, you are working for the central government, you are working for local government, you are working for a statutory body, as long as you are in receipt of funds from the public government, purse, yes. from the public purse, you are required to declare your assets. Okay? In addition to that, people that were working in these institutions were not allowed to have other sources of emoluments. Okay? So if you think the money you're getting from your employer is not enough, go in the private sector. But you cannot hold a public office and at the same time be running a contempt. That already created a problem. Okay? Now, the accounting process was not just to you. It was extended to your wife. Okay? Now, there was also a system in place to make sure that people that thought, hmm, I don't think that your ambassador's lifestyle is consistent with his income, they would report you. They would co co create a tribunal to where you would appear and account for the money for whatever you have. Uh, to show that, so that they can investigate, establish that whatever you have is not, uh, 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 the source is not illegal or you are not using your. So we are the system. Now, if any president is serious about fighting corruption, those are the things that ought to have changed. Now, I mean, uh, people have talked about uh, uh, some presidents have, having been a, a corruption fighter and so forth. But he never changed the institutional framework. If you are serious about corruption, you need to overhaul to the, the entire system. Okay? So that all those, for example, it doesn't make sense 
Somebody is working, say, for Zesco. He has a company that supplies uh, uh, cables. cables. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. You can't. Mm. You know, mm. it's, it's only, it, it's not normal. Mm. You see, because mm. you have to make a guy like that to make a choice. Do you want to continue working for Zesco or you want to go and run your cable supplying company? Okay, because already he's in a conflicted position. Mm. Okay, mm. under the leadership code then, that would never happen. You know, mm. so the whole fight against corruption really is that there's just lip service. What was required, the starting point if this government was serious, was to be able to say, okay, fine, how can we revitalize the, the, the institutions and the laws to do with uh, corruption? Because if you are accusing your predecessor to have been corrupt, how do you continue with the same institutions that existed yeah. under him? Okay, so if you want to do something different, the starting point is to overhaul the entire uh, institution framework that you, you, you inherited. But what has happened is that uh, the institutions have remained the same, uh, mm -hmm. the music has remained the same, but it's only the choir members that have changed, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. We come to the issue of lacuna. The president, in his address uh, to the fourth uh, session of the 13th National Assembly, made some startling claims. He was going sector by sector, I think when he reached on the issues of justice and governance, he spoke about the need to amend the constitution. He spoke about the need for members of parliament to cooperate with uh, uh, possible constitutional amendments that the executive will bring. And he said, look, we've had many constitutional review commissions, we have many technocrats. In short, you are saying there's no need to do that work. The work has been done, probably it's just to pick the laws and bring them to, to parliament for approval. Then he warned that, do you know that, for example, the lacunas that are there can enable one to be an office as president for the next eight, nine years? Of course, he had stayed a hornet nest because, for example, you had warned in 2021 of a life president. He has been accused of trying to uh, make constitutional amendments, for example, that will abolish 50 plus one, that will abolish the, the two terms of mm. officer. There should be no limit. We should be like Rwanda. We should be like UK. Mm. Clearly, the reaction from our people is arising from that suspicion mm. that there's something brewing. Mm. These may attempt to entrench themselves to stay in power mm. far long. Like you had warned mm. that a dominant party may emerge, even a life president may emerge. Mm. Zambians experience that under one party state, mm. and they don't want to go there. Mm -hmm. As a constitutional lawyer, do we need to change the constitution? We have a new constitution amended in 2016. Other than the Bill of Rights, nearly everything else was mm. changed. And that constitution uh, of 2016, credit to Ed Galungu, he signed it was mostly a product of civil society and other people. It wasn't a product of government. So why are we again saying let's have the constitution amendment? Mm. Ambassador, I uh, might sound like a broken record on this issue but i think for the good of the country let me sound like a broken record um and i may also have to use your uh your podcast to appeal to zambians and address the zambians directly and say to them there is absolutely absolutely no reason to amend the Constitution. The Constitution we have may not be perfect because it is drafted by human beings, but it is the best arrangement we have, we have ever had since independence. The challenges that we are having is that of people refusing to respect it. There is absolutely no reason. Let me go back a little bit. The current president cannot make a case 
for amendment of the constitution. His predecessors had reason to, but he has no reason to. If I may explain. The story of constitution making and constitution amendment starts in 1991. We ended one party state. I think the history is important because I've made a categorical statement to say the current president cannot make a case to amend the constitution. He has absolutely no right, moral and otherwise, to call for amendment of the constitution. Let me explain. So we are back in, we go back to 1991. Zambia has decided to say, we are handing one party state, we are going multi party. Agreed. Multi party means abolishing the one party constitution and putting in a new constitution because these are two different systems of government. Yeah. What happens? Kaunda single handedly appoints a commission headed by Professor Mvunga to work out the constitution. MMD, I think there were about 21. A commissioners. MMD was given two seats. MMD refused to say no. There should be equal numbers of commissioners. They boycotted the commission. So they never took part in the work of the Mvunga Commission. Mvunga went, came up with a draft constitution. What happened? MMD rejected that constitution and threatened to boycott the election of 2021. Of 1991. Of 1991. They threatened to boycott that. And people came together and said, listen, let's have a compromise. The compromise was uh, put together at the cathedral. MMD put in certain proposals, but at that time there was already discussion in the National Assembly about not amending the Constitution, Adopting. but adopt, introducing a new Constitution. Mm. Kaunda was magnanimous enough. He considered. He said, okay, what do you want? No, this removed, this removed, this removed, this removed. So the 1991 Constitution was a compromise Constitution. So the understanding from the very onset was that after the election of 1991, the country will embark on a new constitution making exercise. Because this is just to facilitate mm. for now. That was the understanding. Now, after 1991, you remember there is a famous uh, statement by Dr. Chiluba where he was quoted as, as saying, I didn't know that power was so sweet. sweet. <laughs> so after 1991, Dr. Chilwa became reluctant to initiate a new constitution commission. He had to do that in 1993. And that's how he appointed the Manakatwe Constitution Commission. Now, the mandate of the Manakatwe Constitution Commission was to come up with a new constitution to replace that of 1991. Halfway through, Kaunda came and spoiled everything. He said, I'm coming back to politics. <laughs> and the focus of the country changed. Changed. So, Ka uh, Ka uh, Chiluba panicked. So, instead of introducing a new constitution, he decided to cripple the process and settle for an amendment. That is how we see now that amendment coming in, barring Kaunda, that is now how the 1996 amendment. So, we had the constitution of 1991 amended in 1996. But the understanding was a new constitution and not an amendment. Yeah. Okay? Fast forward, Levi Monawasa is president. He says, hey, remember that issue. We didn't finish that exercise. We ended up with an amendment. We still need, we, that amendment is not good enough. We need a new constitution 
as was the understanding in 1991, President Manawasa appoints uh, the, uh, the, the Mungomba, Mungomba Commission. Commission. Willa Mungomba. Willa Mungomba. And then they came up, did their work, and then the recommendation of the Mungomba Commission was that we take the draft constitution to the Constituent Assembly for adoption. So there was a debate between the Constituent Assembly and the Constitutional Conference. So Wanawasa ended up settling for a, a Constitutional Conference. That went on, but unfortunately, he died. So when he died, Arabi took over. That process was botched. It ended there. When President Sata came up, he said, hey, there is still this unfinished business. President Sata said, I don't need a commission. I just need a technical committee to put together everything because there's already enough material. This is just incomplete work. Now, the technical committee went, did its work, and for the record, Ambassador, the work of the committee was involved the highest participation of people than at any other time in the history of constitution making. They had discussions because what the committee did was they started by preparing a draft constitution based on the previous experiences. Now this draft constitution was taken to district level. All the districts, people were put together, they discussed. The recommendations of the district went to the province. From province, it went now to the national, uh, national gathering. And then from there, they now came up with a final draft. Now, unfortunately, President Sata died. That process was not complete. Then President Lungu comes up. In 2016, the constitution was an election issue where president, the current president was promising to say, vote for me, I'll introduce a new constitution. President Lungu says, you know what, he's promising, me, I will do it. But they were all agreed that they, we need to amend the constitution so that the 2016 constitution, uh, 2016 election, is undertaken under a system which required 50 plus one. Because before that it was first past the post. Mm. So there was consensus between UPND and PF on that particular issue. Now how do you achieve that? That is how they said, let's split the process into two. We amend the non-contentious issues and then the Bill of Rights we link it to the election the through a referendum. Mm. That process was a product of agreement between PF and UPND. So when the bill was presented in December of 2015, PF did not have the numbers to pass that bill on its own. It required the involvement of UPND members. If you check the debates of December 2015, it's a very long, de 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 pro uh, uh, long um, record of proceedings. Yeah. I think they went de late into the night. So they went through all those clauses. In fact, even the issues that the president is currently talking about, all those issues were discussed. The original draft, for instance, provided that the president should appoint cabinet ministers from outside parliament. Both UPND and PF rejected that. There was a proposal for proportional representation. Both UPND and PF rejected that. So what came out which President Lungu signed in 2016, 5th January 2016, was a bipartisan product. Mm. Yeah. Now, if people are now talking about lacuna, why didn't they see this lacuna? Mm. This lacuna in 2016. Okay? Now, so the process was complete. 
So we went to a referendum. UPND voted against, campaigned against the referendum. Okay? And in the process, that referendum to, to bring about the Bill of Rights, a new Bill of was defeated. That was people's choice. So the whole process was complete. So we had the Constitution amended, and we had the Bill of Rights, which came from which 1990. Went mm -hmm. Which went to a, a referendum. So we had the Bill of Rights of 1991. So both UPND and PF agreed. So the constitu we don't have a Constitution of, 90, of 2016. <laughs> We still have the Constitution of 1991 as amended in 1996 and as amended in 2016. Now, that amendment was a bipartisan product. Now, if you have taken part in the process, you birthed something, how do you turn around and say, there are lacunas there? How? That is why I'm saying this president cannot make a case for the amendment of the Constitution. Neither can PF make a case for amendment of the Constitution because this was something that they agreed upon. So we shouldn't be talking about amending the Constitution. The 2016 amended Constitution, I think, uh, stands scandalized because the PF, through Buten, said there were lacunas and there were inadequacies in this new Constitution. Let's amend the Constitution, hence Bill 10, mm -hmm. to amend mm -hmm. those identified um, uh, clauses. Mm -hmm. uh, you are among people that spoke against that amendment. Uh, UPND were among political parties that campaigned against Ambassador, Bill 10. I worked, we worked together. Yeah. Okay? We worked together to defeat Bill 10. And my argument was very simple. Okay? And I said, you know what? Allow this document to breathe. Let's test it. It is too early to begin to change. Now, remember, the, we made an amendment in, uh, 20, in 1996. It took us 20 years to revisit it in 2016. Okay? So we changed it 20 years later. And I said, listen, uh, let's allow this instrument. Okay? Uh, but when you look at Bill 10, the intention was really, I think people woke up and realized how much power they had actually ceded. How much powers of the president they had actually ceded through that particular amendment of 2016. And if you look at the entire Bill 10, it was designed to reverse and restore the situation before 2016. And we fought against that we said no there is no problem with this particular instrument and that is why i'm even i agreed to come and speak to you about this in the sense that just like we opposed the amendment of the constitution by pf uh, through bill 10 which was published in 2019 we must equally hold upnd to the same standard we cannot allow the amendment of the constitution okay because upnd opposed it okay now there is no reason there was no reason then to amend the constitution and there is no reason now to amend the constitution just like i worked closely with upnd to defeat bill 10 ambassador i'd work to i'd like to work closely with pf members to make sure that the requisite number of votes are not secured in the National Assembly so that no constitution is amended. Our biggest problem is not the constitution. Our, what we should be talking about is how do we educate our people on the constitution? Government has never undertaken any civic education to educate the people on their own constitution. That is what we should be talking about. And if this government is serious, by the way, do you know that certain provisions have never been actualized? Mm -hmm. For example, there is a requirement to pass an act of parliament to re regulate funding of political parties. That is the law we should be talking about, not, the, not amending the constitution. Let's pass that law. There are many other laws, other provisions that are still remain in abeyance. Yeah. At the last, uh, one of the things that we talked about, for example, 
was uh, how do we make sure that the, the, the mines, the minerals that are being extracted in certain areas, how do we pass a law to make sure that the people in those areas actually benefit from those? Those are the issues we should be talking about, but not an amendment. Remember to create an opportunity for yourself not to miss anything by subscribing and hitting the notification bell. Do you know the law of Moses? All this evil has come upon us. Yet need we not our prayer before the Lord our God that we might turn from our iniquities and understand thy truth. 14. Therefore hath the Lord watched upon the evil and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all his works, which he doeth. Get